Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Samir Venkatraman. I'm your host for this evening's webinar. Um, the topic of this evening's webinar is the art of ovarian stimulation. So first, I would like to introduce our panel. Um, we're very privileged to have two excellent speakers on this evening's panel, Dr. Gita Venkat, who's the director of Harley Street Fertility Clinic, and Dr. Liva Vistrata, who's a consultant gynecologist and fertility specialist, also at Harley Street Fertility Clinic. And in this evening's agenda, um, we will first have the presentations, which will be covering what is ovarian stimulation, a brief history behind it, and then looking at treatments by their aims in terms of monofollicular stimulation, which will cover treatments such as time sexual intercourse with or without ovulation induction and intrauterine insemination, as well as multifollicular stimulation, so covering IVF and ICSI. This event will be recorded and uploaded on our website in due course so that you can revisit it if you miss something or forget something. Um, we will have a question and answer session at the end. Um, so please do raise your hands if you wish to ask a question or you can submit it via Q&A function on Zoom. Um, if you wish to stay anonymous, that's no problem. There's no need to say your name and your camera will remain off. Um, and similarly in the Q&A function, we won't read out your name. Um, so without further ado, I would like to hand over, actually with one last thing, I'd like to make sure, sorry, I'd like to point out that none of our speakers, or panelists have any competing interests to declare. And finally, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Vestrata to start with the introduction. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, so we're going to talk about ovarian stimulation and first is a very uh, a definition about ovarian stimulation. What is ovarian stimulation? It's the pharmacological treatment with the intention of inducing the development of ovarian follicles. So in normal words, what we do is, or what we try to do is growing ovarian follicles using medications. So the next slide. Uh, here's a slide with a little history of the medication. So it's already a long time that people are searching to find the best um, ovarian stimulating drugs. It started already in the 30s when FSH was extracted from pig's blood. Then in the 30s further on, HCG was extracted from the blood and urine of pregnant women. Then a little bit later, uh, urinary, urinary um, medications were used these were extracted from the urine of uh, nuns. Uh, a bit later, uh, when everything comes a bit more sophisticated, recombinant FSH and recombinant LH was found. Actually, over the years, people have been looking to make the drug actually more safe and more efficient. Because if you see on the graph down here, you see that the side effects over the year go down and that the um, safety and efficiency goes up. Yeah, so next slide, please. So when we are talking about uh, ovarian stimulation, we have to make a difference between monofollicular stimulation and multifollicular stimulation. Monofollicular stimulation means stimulating with the aim of having only one follicle or maybe two follicles. I don't know if you know what a follicle is. Uh, when we are doing scans, we can't see the egg on the ultrasound. So what we can see when we're doing a scan is the fluid which surrounds the egg and which is in a little bag. So the little bag or the little sac with the fluid and the egg, we call a follicle. And that's what we see when we are uh, doing a scan. So monofollicular to the aim of have only one follicle, Multifollicular uh, stimulation is we're trying to have as many follicles as possible. And this is used in stimulation for IVF, in vitro fertilization, and for intracytoplasmic sperm injection, ICSI treatment. Um, monofollicular stimulation, so to have only one egg, is used for timed sexual intercourse with or without ovulation induction and intrauterine insemination. Um, probably you all understand why we only want to have 
one follicle for time sexual intercourse and intrauterine insemination. In contrast to IVF, in IVF uh, patients are stimulated and we do egg collection and we take all the eggs out. We fertilize the eggs outside the body and make embryos. And then we can decide how many of those fertilized eggs, so embryos, we place, we replace or we transfer back in the uterus. When it's about timed sexual intercourse or intrauterine insemination, we can't decide how many eggs will be fertilized. If the patient should have like four or five follicles and we inject the sperm in the uterus, that maybe there's a big risk that four or five follicles will be fertilized and the baby will be pregnant with four or five um, children. So um, that's the reason why we make a difference between monofollicular and multifollicular stimulation. So next slide, please. So the medication we use for monofollicular stimulation, uh, probably you all heard already about those medications. It's clomid, uh, clomiphene citrate, and letrozole, letrozole aromatase inhibitor. And then we also have low dose gonadotropins like FSH. So Clomid, um, it's a, a very easy medication to take. It exists in tablets. So tablets you have to take for five days, as well as Retrozole, also medication you have to take for five days. Uh, but sometimes the Clomid of the Litrozole is not doing the trick. And we have to add um, uh, FSH, low-dose low gonadotropins, which is the same medication we use for uh, multifollicular stimulation, so for IVF, but for monofollicular stimulation, we'll be use this medication in a very low dosage, only for 50, 75 uh, units. And when we use this medication in IVF every day, like patient has to inject a daily, when we use it for monofollicular stimulation, we probably will use it like uh, for as injections on alternate days. And the next slide, please. So the mode of action, uh, clomid and letrozole work a little bit in the same way. So both are anti-estrogens. So both medication give the body the impression that there is no estrogen. So what happens? So clomid will do this by blocking receptors in the hypothalamus. So then the pituitary will think, oh, there is no estrogen in the body and will start secreting lots of FSH to induce the um, follicles in the ovaries. Litrozole is a bit the same way. It's also um, an anti-estrogen. It's also a medication which is used in the treatment of cancer, breast cancer. So it works by blocking an enzyme which transforms androgens in estrogen. Again, the body will think there is not enough estrogen and will uh, the pituitary will start secreting lots of FSH to induce um, again, the formation of follicles in the ovaries. Um, the side effects of both medications, so both medications have about the same side effects. Uh, one of the side effects we hear a lot is uh, hot flushes, and this is related to the low estrogen status of the patient, and this is only in the, in the beginning when the patient is taking, actually taking the medication, once um, uh, the, the stimulation of the ovaries has started after the first effect, um, the patient will feel it and, and there's for the most of them no um, side effects uh, anymore. So hot flushes is one of the, uh, the side effects. Headaches is something we hear a lot. Uh, nausea, uh, then also bloating because the ovaries are becoming bigger because of the stimulation. Um, some patients have abdominal pains or have bloating, but it is very reduced. It's not nothing to compare with the stimulation we have with IVF when we actually stimulate very hard. Um, the other problem which can happen is like mood swings, like that one, like in the depressive way, so not in the happy way, more in the depressive way. Um, Letrozole has actually almost the same effects of Clomid. Uh, the only thing which could, what the company say is better with Litrozole is that the mood swing effect is better. So that there are not as many mood swings as with uh, Clomid. But 
um, when we hear patients taking Clomid or Letrozole, most of the time patients are really fine with this medication and this, there are actually not many side effects um, are mentioned. Then who is suitable for this uh, medication? Actually, everybody can take the medication except when they like medical contraindications like liver problems uh, or other problems which are medical contraindications. But we won't give this medication for patients who um, need like IVF stimulation um, or where there is a sperm problem where with monophilic stimulation we won't get the couple pregnant. So next slide, please. So what I said before, so the advantages of monofollicular uh, stimulation in uh, comparison to multifollicular stimulation, chromit and litrozole are both uh, taken as tablets. So it's very easy to take. You have to take it only for five days. Um, so it's really easy in comparison to IVF stimulation where you have to have injections daily and for a longer time. So 10 to 15 days. The disadvantage, of course, is that it's an easier treatment, it's more natural, but the success rates are lower. When the success rates for IVF can go from 40 to 50%, the success rates from monofollicular stimulation with IOI or with time sexual intercourse go from 10% to 15%. So it's um, according to the age. Another advantage from um, monofollicular stimulation with um, the tablets is that there is less monitoring required. Um, when a um, patient is stimulated with um, chromate or litrozole, most of the time the treatment starts on the second day of the cycle and the uh, patient has to take for five days stimulation. Then three, the, the sort of tablets, so three, four, days after stopping the taking the medication, there is another scan. And depending on what we see on that scan, how big the follicle is, we will decide if the patient has to come back another time. So maximum three scans most of the time are needed for this monofollicular stimulation. Um, because we know that the risk are very low, we can leave it by this uh, amount of, of scans. Um, while when we're doing IVF stimulation, uh, we are stimulating at much, much higher dosages with injections, patients have to come back every three days. So, it's, so there is much more monitoring for this kind of stimulation. Uh, disadvantage as well, it's not suitable when there is any real infertility, when there is a low ovarian reserve, uh, or it's a male factor. When there's a male factor, we, we have to go for IVF treatment or ICSI treatment. And so then we won't have, we won't go for monophilic stimulation. Um, there are another advantage that there is less medications required. Yeah, it's only the, the tablets we normally take. And sometimes, as I said in the beginning, when the clomid of litrozole is not working, because this can happen, that there is like a clomid resistance. So that we have to add uh, FSH injections, but we do them in a much lower dosage. Um, so, but all by all, it's less medication as for IVF. And then of course, because it's only tablets and no injections, uh, it's the lower cost of the treatment is really one of the advantages of this kind of stimulation. So then the next slide, then the next slide is about multifollicular stimulation. And I think that Dr. Venkat will uh, talk about this kind of stimulation. Thank you, Leva, for your handing over to me. And uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to say the stimulation is an art. That's why we call the title today as Art of the Ovarian Stimulation. Many people think that the success rate of IVF uh, depends on the quality in the lab. And if the lab quality is good and standard is good, people will get pregnant. No, that is not true. The clinician's role is equally important because the stimulation makes the eggs grow and what type of stimulation is done and how the eggs are made is very important. Then 
it affects the quality of the eggs and that results in the embryos and success rate. And therefore, it's important that the treatment is supervised by somebody who has got good experience in stimulation. That is the key factor to success rate. I believe that it is very important um, because if the stimulation is done properly, not the usual, you know, they say that same stimulation for everybody, same medication, same protocol, same dose for everyone. Uh, I don't think one size fits all. Therefore, we can't use the same stimulation for everyone and expect to have very good results because each person is unique in this world. That we have to tailor the treatment according to the needs. Therefore, coming to the details, basically we can divide stimulation into mild stimulation and full stimulation. Like my colleague, Dr. Vastata mentioned, she was using mild stimulation to create one follicle that is monofollicular ovulation induction. But here the aim is to create more follicles. Why do we do that? In IVF and ICSI treatment, more eggs, that is more follicles, like she explained, gives you more eggs and more eggs means more embryos. Therefore, you have a wider choice of embryos to select from to give, the, give you the baby. And if you have more embryos, we can always freeze them for future use. That is why we say cumulative success rate or pregnancy rate is better if the egg number is better. And that is the aim or the philosophy of this full stimulation or conventional stimulation for IVF treatment, as opposed to the mild stimulation. Now in mild stimulation, there are two types. One is called natural cycle, that is no stimulation medication at all. And the other one is mild stimulation. We use small doses of simple medication. And uh, the difference is in the natural cycle, the women naturally grow one egg every month and ovulate from that. And that egg is used to make the embryo and produce a baby. The only advantage people talk about is, is the quality of the egg is very good when the uh, stimulation is done by the nature. That is the, when the egg is grown by nature because nature does the job very well. So that's called natural cycle. However, many patients are not aware of the disadvantages till they go through it. As you can see, sometimes the egg doesn't grow as per your expectation, it takes a long time. Or then your egg is ready, you are booked for egg collection, you ovulate before the egg collection, that's called premature ovulation. Or we go to collect the egg and then there is no egg sometimes, or one egg doesn't fertilize sometimes. So there are so many factors and you know the success rate is very low. I have to be honest with you. The success rate is very low with the natural cycle. It's usually 10% or lower than 10% with, especially in women with low ovarian reserve. And the next one is mild stimulation. This is in between the traditional full stimulation and the natural cycle. Here we use a small dose of medications like clomiphene, letrozole and small dose of the gonadotrophins, that is the FSH or HMG injections. The idea or logic behind this is to make the woman produce something like four to six follicles and four to six eggs. Therefore, there is no risk of hyperstimulation and the cost of the medication is lower. Again, this is a compromise between natural cycle and full stimulation. Therefore, the quality of the egg is not so much affected or reduced. So this has got the advantages, you know, the best of both worlds. So mild stimulation can be used in some patients. So in which is the group where I would go for mild stimulation? I would say when the ovarian reserve is low, 
the AMH is extremely low, one or two, and the couple want to go for IVF with the bone eggs, then if we usually try with the full stimulation first, because that is going to give them the best chance of success. We here at the fertility clinics aim to maximize your chances to make the baby for you. Therefore, I will say full stimulation is the one everyone should go for in the first treatment. If the women with low ovarian reserve does not produce more than one or two follicles, even with full stimulation, next time I would say, why do we pump her with all these high dose of hormones? She is only making one or two follicles and one or two eggs. Therefore, we make her produce these one or two eggs with small doses of medication. And also the quality will be better and she doesn't have to spend a lot of money on these uh, costly injections. So that's why I would say in those cases, mild stimulation is helpful, but I'm not very keen on natural cycle IVF because as I said, there are so many negative factors. I see people coming from other clinics having had three rounds of natural cycle because in that clinic, it's compulsory. You have to take three, three cycle package, irrespective of what happens to you in the first cycle. And people can have to keep on doing stimulation. And many times they don't even have embryos after three cycles because one round, no eggs, another round, they ovulate, mm. another round, they don't, the egg doesn't fertilize, this kind of stories. Therefore, I say people with low ovarian reserve, if they need to go for, with they produce only one or two eggs, they can go for mild stimulation rather than natural cycle. But our main bread and butter in the sense, most of our patients in our clinic have the traditional convention stimulation. Next slide, please, Will. What is the aim here? Maximize the number of mature eggs. That's very important. And to maximize the chance of success. That's what I was telling you before. We are here to increase your chances, not reduce your chances by making you produce one egg, which is not giving you only less than 10%. Whereas IVF, and the ICSI treatment in our clinic. Of course, the success rate varies with the age and the AMH levels. Generally, in a woman of 30, 35 years with the normal ovarian reserve, they should have a success rate of 50% easily with this stimulation, okay? And now we want to maximize this. However, at the same time, we should not put your health at any risk. That is the minimizing risk of ovarian hyperstimulation. That is why we have to get the balance right. That's very important. And all these are adjusted by, they are dependent on these factors. That is why it's important to know your history and your details. So these things, these two factors depend on age of the woman, antimullerian hormone levels, antral follicular part. These are very, very important. Based on this, we decide what dose of medication should we give. What is the hormone we will use? I'll talk to you about the hormones, like my colleague is telling you how history has developed so many hormones, but even in the recombinant things, there are different types of hormones like FSH and HMG. FSH is simple follicular stimulating hormone. HMG is a follicular stimulating hormone plus luteinizing hormone. Who will benefit from that? I'm going to tell you that in the next few minutes. Okay, so next slide, please. Okay, right. Now, I know recently there was some, I think in the social media, there was some paper or some message saying that uh, IVF clinics are making women produce too many eggs unnecessarily. It is not unnecessary. It's easy for, you know, this paper actually was written by an andrologist who has never done a single stimulation in his life. So I feel really sad. You know, people are just talking about others. He has never done stimulation and people who have co-written the paper also, none of them have done any stimulation. 
And do they know ABC of stimulation? Nothing. So I would like to say, why do we need more eggs? You have more eggs, more embryos, better selection. And I told you, we transfer one embryo. And if it is if it gives you a healthy baby, it is okay. Then what will you do with the other embryos? You can complete your family, come back and use them. That is why having more eggs is important. We don't like patients to have repeated um, stimulation, repeated egg collection, in like some clinics keep on doing that. What you know, if you produce five eggs, you have to do so many rounds. That's why they make money because. They always tell their patient, you need a minimum of three cycles. We don't do that. We tell the patient, look, well, we expect or aim for you to get pregnant in the first attempt. That's why we say that. Anyway, I come to the point. Um, now you can see that live birth rate, correct collection, and uh, according to the age. So if you have more eggs, the success rate is always better. Of course, it is better in the younger age group. This is due to the egg collection. This is live birth rate per embryo transfer. Of course, miscarriage rate increases with the age. Therefore, that's why the age is an important factor and we have to adjust the dose of the hormone according to the age of the woman. Next slide, please. Okay, so this slide actually shows um, how many eggs do you really need to create and make a healthy baby. Now, there is one more thing other clinics don't talk about, but we believe strongly in this. When we collect, say, 15 eggs and make embryos, and you end up having five or six blastocysts, that is day five embryo, which has got the highest chance of implantation potential. If you have five or six embryos, okay, I have I can do five or six embryo transfers and make you pregnant. However, we believe that we must put the right embryo back first. How do I choose that? Because you will have top grade, three top grade embryos. How will I know which one is going to give you the baby? Therefore, we believe in testing the embryos that is called pre-implantation genetic testing. And if you have six embryos, it doesn't mean all six embryos are going to be chromosomally normal. In, I, you might be surprised or shocked to hear this statement, which I'm going to make now. In IVF treatments, even at the, at the age of 30, at least 40% of the blastocysts are abnormal. And as the age increases, the abnormality incre increases. So you can see this in this chart. For example, egg donors and maternal age, yes, this is the uh, age of the woman. You can see that the aneuploidy rate, that means abnormal embryos are 42%. Like I said, 40%. That means only 60% of the embryos are chromosomally normal. If someone has got 10 embryos, you have six embryos which are normal, four abnormal. In a woman who is under 35, but when the woman is 40, it is coming up to 70%, more than 70%. And if somebody is more than 42 years, her aneuploidy rate is 80%. Most of her embryos are going to be abnormal. So even if she makes 10 embryos, only one or two embryos will be normal. But it is important to transfer that embryo rather than transferring all these 10 embryos one by one. I, we had a 48 year old woman. I will tell you, I share my experiences with you. She came and said that she wants to try with her own eggs and we, I was really not very happy with that. Then she said, look, we, we got married late. I want to try now. Okay, we did her AMH. Her AMH was 28. Then I said, okay, she has a chance of making good number of eggs. So let us see what happens. And you may not believe she produced 32 eggs at the age of 48. And she made something like 10 um, blastocysts. We tested all the blastocysts. And out of the 10, 
she had one chromosomally normal blastocyst or euploid blastocyst and we transferred it and she has a baby now she has a little boy so 48 year old she got pregnant with one ex that is a miracle pregnancy however we did the right thing because we did uh, stimulated her with full stimulation and tested her embryos otherwise i would be doing so many transfers clinic will make money from the patient but is the patient going to benefit no so we must reduce the cost we must try to may keep the cost minimal for the patient that means maximize the chances try to make the pregnant in the first attempt that's why we test the embryos and combined that we have so to test the embryos means you are going to lose some embryos if you lose embryos then you need to start with a higher number of eggs to give you some reasonable chance of making uh the euploid embryos and giving you some chance that is the reason for needing more eggs don't think we are all greedy it is not because of that it is because we want you to get pregnant in the first attempt and complete the family with the remaining embryos that is the purpose of more eggs means better success rate so now ladies and gentlemen think about the other side natural cycle you have only one egg how can you maximize your chances so you understand the philosophy in ivf we have more is better but there is at the same time optimal number we can't keep on produce a high numbers because then it produces gives you the risk of hyperstimulation that's what we are going to talk about now see ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome if you google ivf and risk and complication of ivf everywhere it, the first risk mentioned is ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome or in the clinicians call it in short ohss and what is it it's a extra excessive response to the hormones so what happens woman produces something like 35 40 eggs and her ovaries are enlarged the abdomen you know it's distended she has abdominal bloating and these are all written here mild to moderate pain bloating nausea vomiting diarrhea and in severe cases lot of pain nausea vomiting and they can't breathe easily they can't lie down flat that is all because there is fluid in the abdomen and they can't lie down i used i remember now when we started ivf the ohss was much more and now we are able to manage with not so severe ohss because those days we didn't have much medication and when we gave the hormones women used to come with severe hyperstimulation and lot of fluid 2 liters 3 liters of fluid in the abdomen and we used to sit and drain the fluid it used to take one hour sometime my colleague dr vastata will be saying this oh, she has had experiences with this and we used to drain the fluid those days but now the medications are more effective so we don't use, need to use high dosage of medications and we have better protocol so we are able to control the stimulation better and we reduce the risk of ovarian stimulation in the last 15 years i have never aspirated fluid for ohss in from anyone because it never becomes severe and we are able to do it so beautifully maybe i don't know whether it is my experience or it is uh, you know but with experience anybody can see that things are you are able to manage things better of course the medication for controlling the hyperstimulation has also helped us in this and another factor which we say is in reducing the risk is starting with the correct dose and monitoring it very carefully because you know patients who tend to have ohss or women with polycystic ovaries and this is more common in the asian women that's why i have lot of experience with this polycystic ovarian women and their stimulation is extremely difficult if you are scared that they will going to ohss start with a small dose there is no response at all for 10 days so then you increase the dose they go into ohss 
that is the difficulty with the polycystic ovaries. And with them, we have to be careful. We have to monitor them at, uh, you know, by scanning and performing blood tests at regular intervals. Sometimes nearer to the collection, we ask them to come every day if it is needed. And if the estrogen is high and they are developing too many follicles, then we have to reduce the dose. That is why monitoring is important. And in women with polycystic ovaries, again, we have had some cases where you are continuing the medications, follicles are growing, growing, but suddenly there is some flattening or plateauing. And then you see the estradiol levels. Some of them even had a drop in the estradiol levels. And some clinics I know they don't do the blood test at all. They depend only on the scan. And if they don't do it, how will they re recognize this drop in the estradiol? Once the estradiol drops, nobody will get pregnant in that cycle, I can tell you. And I have had patients, I have noticed that in the second time, the second round, I have changed the dosage and medication monitoring and everything. And that lady did not have that drop in the estradiol and she got pregnant and had a baby. So attention to small details is so important in the stimulation. That is why monitoring is very important. And particularly, I'm not saying that every patient should I know some clinics do that as well, and it is so much inconvenience and stress to the patient. Some clinics ask the patients to come every day for scan and blood test, and even twice a day for the blood test. Are they going to adjust the dose so much in a day, twice a day? I don't know, but overdoing things is not going to increase the success rate, but at the same time, when it is necessary, when it is indicated, we should not be lazy not to do that. So. We should do regular monitoring, particularly in women with polycystic ovaries with blood tests to monitor the hormones. Next slide, please. Now we come, in, we come to the nitty gritty of the stimulation. What are the types of stimulation? People always ask you, which protocol did you use when you did the IVF? One is called the long protocol, as its name suggests. The protocol, that is the stimulation, goes for a long time. The other one is called short protocol and because the stimulation is only for a short time. And the first one, it's uh, called down regulation protocol. The ovary is first suppressed with GnRH analog, which is a medication, which is a hormone which suppresses all the hormones. So after 15 days of suppression, then gonadotropins, that is FSH and HMG are started and the stimulation goes. Now, this is the first protocol. It started with that when we started IVF. And this was the only protocol available. But this one had higher risk of OHSS, particularly in PCOS patients because after deep down regulation, all the women needed high dose to make the eggs grow. And because we had to use high dose, the PCO women produced lots of eggs and went into hyperstimulation. And that's why I told you, we have sat and drained fluid from women's abdomen. But slowly, I would say this analog protocol was very popular. I mean, it started in 80 and 90s, then towards the end of 90 and the beginning of uh, the millennium 2000, the antagonist came into picture. The antagonist also suppresses the hormone, but it suppresses specifically the hormone which, which uh, is responsible for the ovulation. So the purpose of down regulation with the analog in the long protocol is to prevent premature ovulation. And when we did that one, it was suppressing all the hormones. And that's why we had to give high dose. Whereas this is a selective suppressant, it su suppresses only LH, which is responsible for the ovulation. That's why it's called antagonist. And that means what happens is the dosage of the hormones uh, for stimulation is minimal here. We don't need a high dose. 
And also stimulation is only for 12 days, 10 to 12 days or 14 days maximum. You are not taking medications for one month. That's why this is called short protocol and it is patient friendly protocol. And nowadays, most of the clinics use antagonist protocol. Initially, there was a hesitation because uh, people were not very familiar. They were uh, not uh, used to managing the protocol very well. Success rate was low. But now everyone is familiar with this protocol. Success rate is the same with this short and long protocol. And uh, most of us uh, use short protocol because it's easier for the patient. Next slide, please. Yes, I, like, uh, I think I told you before, um, monitoring is, should be optimal. That is the word we are using because, you know, if somebody, it's like uh, to please the patient, I will say, okay, you come every day for a scan and blood test. It is, is it needed? Are we going to change the dose every day? It is not. I'm not going to change the dose every day. And it is only unnecessary inconvenience for the patient. And on top of it, now with COVID time, we should reduce the number of visits. We should reduce the number of unnecessary visits to the clinic. And especially when patients are getting stressed with the treatment, with the hormones and everything, don't make them come to the clinic every day. Otherwise, you can provide a room for them. They can all stay there in the clinic so that you can scan them every day because the journey sometimes can be very difficult. They, are all, they travel one or two hours. Therefore, optimal monitoring means at regular interval, whenever it is needed, so we have. And there is always a discussion about, you know, standard stimulation. That is, we, people will say, we use the same protocol, same stimulation, and same dose of medication for everybody. And we don't increase the dose. Yes, it has happened in some clinics because we get patients after three cycles of IVF, five cycles of failed IVF. And then I uh, sort of sit with them, go through with them. Both of us, all the clinicians in our clinic, we sit and go through with them. What has happened in each cycle? What medication? How long? When, what dosage was used? Some of them tell me that, you know, they, when they started with so much this medication, 150 units, they uh, she developed only four follicles. Here is a woman who's 32 years with good ovarian reserve. Why she's producing four follicles? And then the, the, the couple told me the clinic advised them to continue the same dose and she ended up with having only five eggs. And then next time um, before starting the next cycle, the clinician told her, maybe we should have started you on a higher dose. I was thinking this is a whole waste of one cycle. And I believe, and our clinicians and our, you know, clinic, we believe that personalized stimulation is very important. Each person is unique. How one person responds to stimulation is different from another person. Say take 10, 32-year-old women, all of them will not respond in the same way, even though they all have normal ovarian reserve because each person is different. Therefore, it's, it's important to tailor the treatment according to the individual, like looking at their uh, age, weight, hormone levels, and previous stimulations, this kind of things, and then change, or make adjustments, and, uh, and increase the dose if it is needed so that the cycle is not wasted. That is why personalized stimulation is important. If you go to uh, large corporate clinics, they don't have time for all this personalized stimulation. I'm not criticizing any clinic. It is, that is the way they work, but they also have a uh, success rate. So, but if you have had some failed cycles, it is important that you have a personalized stimulation in some, any, any clinic where you go. Okay. And uh, as I told you before, in all these things, the experience of the clinician is very, very important. Um, they somehow feel looking at the scan, you know, how many follicles and how the estradiol is going up. Somehow we get the feeling 
we may not be able to explain, we will say, look, let's do this and come back tomorrow. We will check it again. We are cautious. And whereas if the doctors are not so much experienced, I won't say they will make mistakes, but certain fine tuning will be missed. That is the main thing. But as I told you, attention to detail is important. It's the key factor to success rate. Next slide, please. Okay, so I think I have covered most of the points. You know, if you let me, I can talk about the stimulation for more than an hour. And that is why I think they have given me a time limit. And I hope I have covered most of the points. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, you feel free to ask us. We are more than happy to clarify your doubts. And thank you for listening to all of us and uh, our method of stimulation of the ovaries. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you very much. So I'd like to turn it over for questions and answers. Uh, we've already had a few questions in over the Q&A function on Zoom. Sorry, my computer appears to have frozen. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can't see you. Okay, see fine. You. It's just my computer. Right. Um, the first question we've had, it says, you say it's no good for women with low ovarian reserve to try letrozole. Are you saying that this is no good for the low ovarian reserve? And it only took one course, but unfortunately res this resulted in a molar pregnancy, um, but it still worked, which is the opposite of what you're saying. Um, talk to Vastrasa, because this was sort of targeted at letrozole monofollicular stimulation. Yeah. Do you mind answering this question? Yeah. Thank you, Nadia, for the question. And I'm really so, I mean, I'm happy that you got pregnant, but I'm sorry that it was a more pregnancy. But you're absolutely right. It's not when you, that you can't get pregnant when you're taking letrozole. It's a, actually a big topic in lots of medical conferences. Uh, when you have a low ovarian reserve, what is the best thing? Taking uh, like high dosages of medications or taking something like letrozole or promit. Uh, there are lots of studies about it, and most of the time the tendency is more to go for the high, uh, the high stimulation, uh, as Dr. Mvenkat had mentioned it before, because we would like to have, so every follicle we can have, of every egg we can have, try to, to catch it. But this doesn't mean at all that you can't get pregnant with the result from it, and you're the best example of that. So you're absolutely right, you can get pregnant and you can use it with lower brain reserve. But um, nowadays, um, we are more tended to use like a heavier stimulation for lower brain reserve. Yeah. Thank you. The next question we have is, what are your thoughts on downregulation protocol in women over 40? And would you advise DHEA to be used in such cases of especially women who are over 40 but do not have a low ovarian reserve. Thank you. The question down regulation, yes, down regulation protocol can be used for women over the age of 40. However, we must remember if we use down regulation protocol, we will, because of the down regulation, we will need higher dose of gonadotropins, FSH and HMG. And that means you will be spending more money on the medication. That is my worry. And also it will go on for a longer time. Whereas if you can achieve the same thing with antagonist protocol in a shorter time, with uh, you know, not a sort of more cost-effective way, then we can go for antagonist protocol. But there is no harm in using um, down-regulation protocol. We particularly use this down-regulation protocol in women with uh, endometriosis because if somebody has got endometriosis, it will suppress the endometriosis and make the quality of the eggs better. And similarly, if we have some women with adenomyosis also, we tend to use down-regulation protocol. So if this is needed, I think we should use, there is no doubt between the two. However, I will say generally, we want to make things easy for women. That's why we tend to use this antagonist protocol. But if clinically indicated, we will use that. 
And the second part of the question was whether to use DHEA in women over 40 with normal ovarian reserve. Okay, so if the ovarian reserve is good, there is sort of no need to use DHEA in general because it is an expensive medication and it is a kind of hormone. Whereas we usually use other supplements like coenzyme Q10 and as well as uh, the melatonin. These two are supposed to improve the egg quality by in, in increase the, um, increasing the or improving the function of uh, ribosomes in the cytoplasm and mitochondria in the cytoplasm, they improve the function of the cell. So egg is a cell, it improves the function of the egg. My, um, the melatonin also works in similar way by improving the energy for the cell. And therefore we tend to give these two. But if somebody has got borderline ovarian reserve or low ovarian reserve, we give DHEA. Okay, right. Let me see. Uh, there are some more questions. All cystic or two miscarriages, which treatment should be used? Okay, so polycystic ovaries. Um, as, as I said, it's a very tricky condition, difficult to manage. And miscarriage is commonly associated with polycystic ovaries. That is due to various factors. And uh, there is a lady who has just mentioned in the question, she has got polycystic ovaries and she has had two miscarriages. And, I, and then what treatment do you recommend? I would say under these circumstances, we go for the IVF treatment because stimulating one, uh, you know, stimulating the polycystic ovaries women to produce one follicle is going to be extremely difficult. If you use the medication in a slightly higher dose, like I said, small doses don't work. Increase the dose, 10 follicles grow. And that is then we have to cancel the cycle. It is such a waste of those eggs. That is why we say, Monofollicular in ovulation induction is difficult in PCO. They are better off going for IVF because even with Clomid, two tablets daily for five days, some of them produce six to eight follicles. That is more than enough. And we can do IVF with them. So IVF is the best option with women having polycystic ovaries. And also because of the miscarriages, our point key point here will be to perform poly, the pre-implantation genetic testing. Then once we test, we can remove the embryos which are chromosomally abnormal, transfer only the chromosomally normal embryo, then it will reduce the risk of miscarriage. Of course, there are other issues like implantation and other things which need to be considered also. But this is one of the important things to reduce the risk of miscarriage. So, we right, so one of the questions we had is, if someone has a very high prolactin that is maintaining as high, that's 700, um, what would you do? Okay, 700, you see the normal prolactin level is at, around, uh, should be less than 500. 700 is a value I would say is usually associated uh, with polycystic ovaries. It is not very high. If it is more than 1,000, we get really concerned about it because it's indicative of any pituitary adenoma. And so the prolactin should be normally tested because of this in the afternoon at 2 p.m. after 30 minutes rest. Because prolactin, prolactin is also known as the stress hormone. If somebody tells you, I'm going to take your blood, immediately your body is just, you know, the stress in your body goes up blood pressure goes up, prolactin goes up. Therefore, if you really need to know what is the correct value, better to repeat it at 2 p.m. after 30 minutes rest. And also the lab will check what is called a macro prolactin. The macro prolactin is an inactive prolactin and it might just add the number, but it's not going to do any harm. 
high prolactin can interfere with implantation of the embryo? That was a good question. That's why I think uh, we must bring the level of the prolactin to the normal range. Okay, the next question that we had was about if someone is having immune tests and they have a high LAD level, what would you, how would you treat that? High LAD, LAD level. And they've been recommended lip therapy. Yeah, correct. So that is true. So if some women have repeated miscarriages, uh, one of the things which is uh, thought about is called LIT treatment. This is leukocyte immunization therapy. And uh, so the test which is performed for this is called a leukocyte antibody de uh, detection test, LAD. Uh, so both the partners, male and female partners, blood is taken and tested. And what they check is the antigens in male partner and the female partner, and whether the woman has got high level of antibodies to the male uh, partner's antigens. Supposing uh, she has got low level of uh, antibodies to some of the antigen he has got, then this can lead to miscarriage because pregnancy and implantation need immunological protection. Otherwise, the body thinks it's a foreign body and the body rejects it. And to protect it, the woman should have antibodies against the antigen from the male partner. That is why this test is done. And if it is present, what they do is they take the male partner's blood and it is prepared and uh, they inject it into the woman. And it is done once and then three weeks later it's done second time. It is supposed to uh, make the woman develop antibodies by injecting the man's uh, antigens. So that's how it helps. This is called Blitz test. Okay, sorry, there was a clarification. Uh, yeah, this treatment, sorry. Okay, there's a clarification on that question, which is to say, the lady has high cytokines and low LAD. Would you use hydroxychloroquine? Lit therapy? Sorry, high cytokines and? Low LAD levels. Yeah, okay. Would you use hydroxychloroquine, LIT therapy, or intralipids or steroids? Well, we have to, you know, it's difficult to answer these questions with isolated readings. When we look at the immune results, there is loads of tests I will look at it. What is the anti-nuclear antibody level? What is the thyroid antibody level? And what about the blood clotting issues? What is the Th1, Th2 level? What about the natural killer cells? There are so many things. It's not that one is increased, I will do this. If the other one is increased, it is not. We have to look at the whole picture, but generally, I will don't use this hydroxychloroquine in this situation. Okay. Hydroxy, but rather than that, lips will be better. Thank you. Um, there was also another question on the use of dexamethasone hmm. um, in stimulation. And how do you feel about it? Yes, this, again, dexamethasone is a steroid and uh, it's supposed to help with the growth of the eggs. And uh, we all, some people recommend dexamethasone and some people recommend growth hormone and in these conditions. But nowadays, I think dexamethasone was used in stimulation previously because we were all doing fresh transfers. And it had a dual role, not only stimulation, but also for implantation mainly. But now since we are all freezing the embryos and testing the embryos, putting them back in the subsequent cycle, any steroid is used more for the frozen embryo transfer than the fresh cycle. And uh, nowadays people don't see a huge or significant role of dexamethasone in the stimulation, but still some people use growth hormone for stimulation. They, there are papers which say that uh, people who use growth hormone, human growth hormone, along with the gonadotropins, especially over the age of 40 years, have a higher live birth rate compared to don't, those people who don't use growth hormone. Thank you. 
Um, and I wanted to apologize for the technical glitch once more. If any of you have any questions that weren't answered, unfortunately, I lost all of the questions that were submitted earlier. Um, please resubmit them or put up your hand um, and we'll definitely answer them. I do apologize. For so we'll give everyone a couple of minutes just to submit any questions they might have. And if there are no other questions, uh, we will conclude the webinar. Right, sorry, the other one is, is it common during IVF stimulation for one ovary to not respond? I had one ovary with two small follicles, but the other ovary had nine follicles, um, but I only got five eggs. Could age be a cause of this? I'm nearly 42. Dr. Benkamp, you wouldn't mind. Yeah, okay. So th that is a very interesting question because we see this happening many times in our scans and the ovarian stimulation. I think uh, my colleague, Dr. Vastata, will agree very much with me. And we see in some patients, one ovary is quiet and uh, other ovary is producing 10 follicles, that one ovary is producing only two follicles. Yes, um, you're right. That can happen. That is not a problem at all. As long as we get eggs, whether it's from the right ovary or left ovary, it's not a problem. But you also said you've got only five eggs. That means some of the follicles must have been empty. Yes, it can be due to the age factor, or sometimes if it is due to the low ovarian reserve, low AMH levels, such women can also have empty follicles. That's called empty follicle syndrome. It can happen. That's why some follicles are empty and we get fewer eggs. Okay. And the next question is, what do you think about multiple stimulation and egg collection cycles in a row? Some clinics seem to favor this quite strongly. Um, if I can actually have both doctors as well, so that'd be good. Multiple stimulation cycle, first of all, uh, you know, like I said in my uh, presentation, I like to make the women pregnant in the first attempt itself. So this multiple cycle, I don't know when uh, we do, when we need it, but this is applicable in some women with low ovarian reserve because they may not have as many eggs as we would like them to have in one attempt, then we can do multiple cycle. And another important place we must remember about this multiple stimulation is any fertility preservation in situations like cancer because they want to get as many eggs as possible. Sometimes they Reserve will be AMH maybe only three and four. Therefore, we do that. And doing stimulation back to back is not harmful to the woman, doesn't increase the risk of cancer or any problem. And the response is not lower. In fact, there are some papers nowadays in encouraging what is called dual stimulation. And I have done this in my clinic. What it means is if somebody's ovarian reserve is low, and we say you will need at least three cycles, then you can complete the three cycles in six weeks instead of three months. That means we do one stimulation with the period, and then after egg collection is completed, three days later we start another stimulation. That means the stimulation will occur in the luteal phase of the cycle, and, and then third stimulation will be Again, the patient will have a period and followed by the period, the third stimulation. Now the question is, will the response be the same? Outcome will be, will it be similar? Yes, there are papers and people have done research and they found that in the, between the follicular phase stimulation and the luteal phase stimulation, women produce similar number of eggs and make similar number of euploid blastocysts. That means there is no difference in the quality of the eggs, number of the eggs produced. And in fact, the stimulation is done twice in one month. Therefore, doing three stimulations on a monthly basis is not at all a problem. Thank you. The next question that we have, actually, Dr. Strasser, do you have anything you'd like to add? No, I think then Dr. Lenka answered this question really good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, is there any medication available for getting follicles 
for patients who have had or who have premature ovarian failure. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Vastata, would you like to answer or shall I? Uh, no, no, you can. I, I mean, I don't think that there are many medications available for yes. follicles for patients having premature ovarian failure. You can try if the, the ovarian are not working anymore, it's not much you can do as you can try to stimulate the ovaries and hope that some of the ovaries will react. But most of the time, the only option will be like egg donation. Correct. Correct. I don't know what you think, but. Yeah, and what I wanted to say here is when we say premature ovarian, um, failure, or there is one stage before failure. Yeah. Um, so it is called premature ovarian insufficiency. So premature ovarian failure, POF, POI, that means we come to realize that, you know, say somebody is 30 years and her AMH is two or three and she has got only four antral follicles. Okay, so she's going to go into premature ovarian failure, but she's one step before that. She is in the premature ovarian insufficiency stage at this stage, there is some hope because there are some four or three or four follicles. And the advantage here is the woman is young. So the, there is a possibility that the quality may be good. And at this stage, we must try to collect as many eggs as possible. And that's why multiple cycles may be useful here and do IVF or ICSI and make embryos. And at this stage, there is some point in taking the DHEA and CoQ10. One is to improve the number of uh, antral follicles and the other one is to improve the quality of the eggs because when the ovarian reserve goes down or the total number of eggs go down, the remaining eggs co quality is not so good. It's like a basket, you know, all the good sweets are gone first. All the remaining ones at the, at the bottom are all the crap ones. So. Uh, that is the situation here also. The quality is affected. Therefore, if we want to improve the quality and increase the number, we can do that. But here I know somebody will ask me, when women are born with the eggs and as they grow, the eggs, you know, they lose the eggs and sometimes premature ovarian failure, they lose the eggs prematurely. And if they, they can't make eggs, how can you increase the number of eggs? Okay. To answer your question, what I'm going to say is there is pool of eggs inside the ovary. What happens in nature, every month, the ovary brings some follicles. These are called antral follicles. So inside the ovary, they are in the form of primordial follicles. That is the early stages, very, very immature eggs. And that develops into primary follicles, secondary follicles, then becomes antral follicles. That is the stage at which we see in scan in the beginning of the cycle, how many follicles are there in each cycle. So with this medication DHEA, we are able to bring some more follicles, antral follicles. We are able to mature more primordial follicles into antral follicles so that in a cycle, a woman will, will produce something like six eggs instead of two eggs or three eggs. That is the idea of this medication. That's what we are trying to do so that she can benefit from it. Thank you. The last question that we have, actually there's a follow-up to that. If my AMH level is less than 0 0.2, will DHEA still work? It depends on the age of the woman. Dr. Vastata, don't you agree? I okay. think it, it depends on the age of the woman. The, if yeah. the AMH is less than 0 0.2, yeah. and if the woman is uh, so 25, it's a different scenario. If somebody is 45, it's a different scenario. They are 38, so they're in between. So we'll put a maybe. Mm. Well, you, there is no harm in trying it because you can try. If it works, you are lucky. You got it. If it doesn't work, unfortunately. But you can at least feel that you have tried everything. Okay. And the last question that we have for this evening is, can you sometimes find that a woman has a good anthropological count, but her AME is quite low? Her yes. lady, she's nearly 42, and her antropological count was 13, and her AMH was 
<laughs> yes, Dr. Vastata, we come across this situation <laughs> on many occasions. Yes. yes. And, uh, you know, I, this, they can, um, it can happen in either way. Sometimes the AMH is 16 and they have only six follicles. Or, like you said, AMH is six, they have 16 follicles. So, and uh, then it is difficult to say which to believe. We have to wait and see because each person is different. And, but most probably, I think when the stimulation happens, if there are not many follicles because she can't produce more eggs, even though AMH is 16, if she has only six central follicles, she won't produce 10 eggs. Is that right, Dr. Mastata? I think it's absolutely right. I was just thinking that this question is coming from the same person who had only one ovary who was functioning and who had only five eggs, okay, nine follicles yeah. and five eggs, which is actually a uh, FC of 13 and then AMH of six. So the yes. six eggs are compatible with the AMH of six actually. Correct, correct. Yeah. So that is why I said in each case, it's difficult. Sometimes you have more follicles, but if the AMH is low, then some follicles don't grow because some of them don't have eggs. If I could summarize both of your opinions, I think in conclusion, we'd like to say that these are all indicators of someone's fertility. They don't actually tell us what's going on. These are only metrics that we try and use to gauge someone's fertility and how they might respond to treatment in order to try and predict their chance of success. Yeah, you can't go by one reading, one reading. I think we have to take into account both and try our best to help the women with such issues. We can't say that she will produce 16 eggs or six eggs on one way or other. And also in such women, the response can vary from month to month. One month she might have six eggs, another month different. So. Uh, it depends on the body also. That month, somehow, our body may, may be in an optimal state and produce more. So if these things cannot be sometimes predicted and also explained. Thank you very much. Those are all the questions that we have. So I would like to wrap up by, first of all, thanking our audience and reminding you to look at all your relevant treatment options. Don't be afraid to ask questions of the doctors and the other people you speak with. Please do come and talk to us if you have more questions. Don't forget, we do still have the pandemic raging. As you can see, the background behind Dr. Vestrata is still <laughs> quite pertinent. Please continue to be safe, be careful, be mindful of your health and those of the other people around you, particularly if you're having treatment. And please do consider getting vaccinated to help look after the population. Our next webinar will be next month um, in, I can't believe it's going to be August next month. Um, it's going to be on egg freezing. We would love for you to join us if you're interested in this. And then you can find our future topics and webinars as well as our recordings on our website at the address provided. So all that remains is for me to thank our panel. Um, so I'd like to thank Dr. Venkat and Dr. Vistrati for a very informative talk this evening. And I'd like to thank our audience for joining us this evening, and I hope that it was useful. So uh, thank you all, and I bid you all a good evening and a lovely weekend.